We are in Acts chapter 15, verse 36 through 1610. And uh, as we get into this message today, I, w- I have a question for each one of you. What was your favorite TV show growing up? I mean, it, it, it will betray your age very quickly. You'll discover how quickly, how old you are and how time flies. I was reminded, you know, sometimes you think that you're young until you start hanging out with people that are a lot younger than you, and then you're reminded very quickly that you're a lot older than you thought. And I had that this past week. I was trying to explain to my eight-year-old son how a telephone worked in the 80s. And I didn't realize how difficult that would be. And he said, so there's a cord? I said, yeah, there was a cord that was attached. And I said, don't you ever see Superman? And he ch- changed in the telephone booth. What's a telephone booth? Oh my gosh. You just realize how much time has changed and how older you get. Older you get. And, and I'm watching with my son, uh, one of his TV programs. And I remember the TV programs that I liked as a kid when things were simple. And I was trying to explain to my son that when you got home from school, what did you do? And I wanted to go watch TV. And he's like, well, didn't you have Netflix? No, the internet didn't exist, son. And you would watch a TV show, and you know what? It would come on a certain time, and then it was done, and you never saw that show ever again. You could never watch, and he was like terrified at this idea that he could never see that TV show ever again. He didn't understand what, how, what it meant to have something on one moment and be gone the next. And he wanted to know what shows that I watched when I was a kid. And I was trying to explain to him that I would get home from school, and I was an 80s kid, so I would want to watch Transformers, the original, and then I would want to watch G.I. Joe. And I remember, it's funny, the things you remember as a kid, stuff from different TV shows, theme songs, expressions, words. Uh, And I I remember G.I. Joe, there was always this public service announcement where the G.I. Joe character would show up in the middle of some episode in kids' lives, and they would explain this lesson, and at the end of it, they'd say, and knowing is half the battle. And I've never lost that. I, knowing is half the battle. No matter how many, uh, how, many, how many years go by, I can remember that little phrase from this, this TV show. And, and there's a lot of truth in that. When you know something, you can get through it. Like if you know what's coming, you know what to expect. I, I remember this with my, my wife when I was in seminary. I, uh, I kind of made this deal with her and I said, hey, we're going to do this for a couple of years and then uh, it'll be done. So we'll go out to New England, we'll live here and see what God does. And, and then at the end of that, I said, I think I want more schooling. And she's like, hold on. Like, I, I was prepared mentally to do this. And now you're changing it. And it's hard if you're not prepared for it. You need that preparation mentally and emotionally to know what you're going through. When I was a youth pastor, I would take my youth leaders uh, away on a retreat and I would teach them and say, this is what you're going to encounter with these kids so that when it t- time came, they knew how to handle it. They were prepared for it. Well, I think a lot of that, that knowledge half the battle is, is really a mission awareness of what's going on. And as we examine Acts, we see this passage that's laid out for us of what these early disciples were doing and how they were ministering and some of the circumstances and obstacles that they encountered. And I think that the Holy Spirit has given this to us to show how the church is spread, to show how the gospel was transforming hearts and minds, but also it records what was happening in the disciples' lives as a means of revealing to us some of the trials that we might encounter, that we might become aware of them so that when we are sharing the gospel, when we are seeking to expand the mission or the kingdom of God as we are on mission before him, that we might be aware of the different things we might encounter so that we might be prepared for them and be able to deal with them when they come. Because oftentimes I find that when someone becomes a follower of Christ, they, they, they might pray a prayer, they get baptized, and then they go, now what? Well, let me tell you, this is what's going to happen. This is what you need to understand about who God is. This is what you need to understand about how people are going to respond to you now. These are going to, you're going to have changes within you that you yourself may not even begin to understand as you're growing and wanting to read the word of God and and be around the people of God and and, and worship the the name of God and be in the presence of God. And and your, your family and your friends aren't going to respond really well. And you're going to have this that you have to deal with. And so today we're going to look at that and what that means, that we might get a a mission awareness of what is going to happen to us as we examine this episode in the life of the early church as the gospel continues to, or excuse me, continues 
to expand, that we might be aware of what we might face as well as be equipped to handle it well. But let's take a moment to pray and ask God to, to speak to our hearts that we might truly receive what it is that he has for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for your word. I'm grateful for your people. I'm grateful for your spirit and your presence in this place. I'm grateful that your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and that it is profitable for preaching, teaching, and training the man and woman of God that they might be fully equipped for every good work. And Lord, I pray today that our hearts might be truly open to receive your word, that we might not only hear with our ears, but hear with our hearts, believe with our minds, and act with our wills to fully do and accomplish all that you've laid out for us in your word. Lord, we long to be transformed, to be conformed to your image, to, to know you. And we ask you, Lord, today to speak to our hearts, to speak to us as your people, your church, so that we might go forth changed, empowered, and fully aware of what's going on as we are on mission for you. Bless us and be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here's the, I want to lay out this episode before us. Because this mission of Christ is a wonderful privilege, but it also comes with difficulty as we see. Let's start with in verse 36. So I would encourage you to follow along with me in this passage because there's a lot that's here that I think that we all need to see together. And after some days... Paul said to Barnabas, remember these two are, are kind of uh, this um, uh, ministry partners. Is there, they, they've been called by the Holy Spirit to minister together. They've been ministering together now. Uh, and it says, and after some days, they're in Antioch of Pisidia. Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. We want to go back and, and visit these churches we planted. We, went to, we, we started these churches, they would respond to the gospel of God, we, we placed elders in them, and that's not enough. They, they, they need to grow, we need to check in on them because they need some supervision. They need us to, to make sure that they're doing the right thing. We need to be there to shepherd them to be the people that God wants them to be. Now, as they're going along, though, they have this idea of this ministry and a philosophy of doing this, and it's to bring people along to mentor them, kind of apprentice. See, that's part of what discipleship is. It's not just teaching people. I think we in the West, we miss that. We think it's just sitting in a class. It's not that. It's, it's like coming alongside me and doing life together. Uh, I know that when I was in college, I'd never been discipled. I'd, I'd grown up in church, I'd heard lessons, I'd been in Sunday school classes and attended vin vacation Bible schools, and, uh, but I never had someone sit down and go, this is really what it means to follow Jesus. And I started this ministry in my hometown and I didn't know really what I was doing, I just wanted to reach people for Jesus and it grew really quickly and I still didn't know what I was doing. And so I remember going back to Moody Bible Institute, I was sitting in the cafeteria with uh, uh, some people from my sister floor, uh, and I, I had a professor sit down, and he hears me talk, and he goes, hey, he goes, have you ever been discipled? I'm like, nope. He goes, be at my office tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. I thought, oh, great, you know, what, what am I going to expect here? And what he did is he proceeded to teach me, but then he invited me to go with him to minister. He invited me to go to a Filipino Bible study with him. Oddly enough, I didn't know anything about the Philippines. I knew there was a book in the Bible I thought was named the Philippines, the, the, you know, the Philippians, I thought, were in the Philippines at the time. It took me a time to grow and understand that they were actually very two distinct people, the Philippians and the Philippines. And then I, I got to minister to these people, and I got to see them. And we walked in, and he, he introduced me. He went around the room, and then he, he began to show me what it was to serve Christ. He didn't say anything specifically. He just modeled it. And he was teaching me as he went. He was mentoring me on how to follow Jesus. And so that's what we have, these guys are trying to do. Paul, especially Barnabas. Barnabas loved to mentor people. He'd mentored Paul, he'd vouched for Paul. Because remember, Paul, after he was converted, he'd been public enemy number one, and then he says, hey, by the way, I'm saved. And, and the guy's looking around going, he put my brother in jail last week, are you kidding me? I'm not letting that guy in. And Barnabas, 
who'd come from a Jewish background, he saw just how genuine Paul's faith was. He vouches for Paul and introduces him to the apostles and shows that he's really a safe guy. And then the Holy Spirit had called both of them to do ministry together. Barnabas was all about encouraging and mentoring younger men. And so he wants to bring along his nephew or cousin, we're not exactly sure, we know it was a near relative of his, John Mark, and he wants to bring him along this journey, he wants to mentor him, he wants to, to really show him what it means to follow Jesus. Now Paul though, Paul doesn't want John Mark to come along, because John Mark had messed up royally in Paul's mind. They'd been on ministry together before, and John Mark totally said, I'm out. I can't do this for whatever reason. We don't know exactly why. Perhaps he didn't like the ministry that they were doing with the Gentiles. Perhaps he had some family concerns. Perhaps he was just very immature in what he was going through. We don't exactly know. We know that according to Paul, that he deserted them in the ministry. So now John Mark wants to go and Paul's like, I'm not bringing this young guy. He has not proven himself. I don't want him to go. Hey, Barnabas is like, hey, give a second chance to him, right? He needs a second chance. He needs somebody to vouch for him. Come on, bring him along. He's like, no, he messed up. I don't want to go through this again. I can't be in another country and have this guy I'm depending on totally leave me in the ministry. So this sharp disagreement and the text the way it makes it the sound is that it was almost as if they get into a big verbal fight. It's a huge deal. Now, what do we, can we learn from that? I want, to pause, I want to put a pause there for a moment, and I, I want us to really see and gather ourselves, and what, what can we gather from this? What principle can we draw from this text? And I believe it's this, that as we are on mission for Christ, we can see that we, there may be conflict that we're going to encounter. As long as we interact with people, there's going to be conflict. If you're going to be in ministry, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be personalities you don't like. There's going to be people doing things the way that you don't want it to be done or you think it should be done differently or someone that you knew and loved did it differently and you want it to be done that way. And it may not be a sinful issue. You just might have a different way of going about it and that leads to conflict. And here we have two of the early leaders of the church at conflict with one another. And these conflicts can be pretty severe. These aren't just minor disagreements. This is a severe conflict. And this conflict around John Mark was whether he was worthy to be counted on for the mission at hand. And this sharp disagreement refers to a provocation which literally jabs and cuts someone so that they must respond. That's the word there that's used in Greek. That's the, the full meaning of it. Meaning that someone says something so frustrating to you that you can't just sit back. You ever had someone do that? And, and uh, there was a cartoon that would say it, uh, the, the Looney Tunes cartoons, which you never see anymore, but it was, them are fighting words. You say somewhere, you're like, I, no, 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 I, I can't let that go. I've got to respond to it. And this disagreement is happening between Paul and Barnabas where it's so sharp, so harsh, so severe that there had to be a separation to them. And so these conflicts can't be resolved with mediation, it can't be resolved in the moment, and may lead to separation. We might have that, and an unfortunate separation that occurs. Notice what happens in verse 39. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Now there are some times when separation is necessary. And this might be for several reasons. We're to separate if someone drifts away from the truth of the faith. If they continue in sin after being confronted, we separate. However, that should not be our first step. Our first step should be reconciliation and maintaining unity. As Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Paul says to the Ephesians, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And sometimes you can't solve it in a moment. You've got to, to, I mean, we want to try. We need to try to maintain the bond of peace at all costs. But there are times when we have to separate, even if it's just for a moment to gather ourselves, uh, to continue on. I mean, Paul knew what he was talking about when he admonishes us to maintain unity and agree with one another, as we can see from his words to two women in the church of Philippi who were in disagreement. In Philippians 4, 2 through 3, it says, I entreat Iodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. 
Yes, I also I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. He wanted them to agree in the Lord, to come to a conclusion, to sit down. But here, there wasn't that option yet. Maybe it was because the, the boats were there, they needed to go. Perhaps they, they just couldn't come to an agreement on it, and it led to a separation. And while separation is not the ideal, we can see through them that God did bless their mission trips to, despite their divergence. Look at verse 39. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now this mission continues on, and it's actually broadened because of it. Barnabas has John Mark with him, who would prove himself faithful as a servant of Christ through this and subsequent ministry. And Paul continued on with Silas, going through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches that had been planted. Now what can we learn from this? It's that no matter what, that if there's separation, I mean, if the disagreement's been severe, and if there's even been separation, which is not what we want, we pray that God would continue to strengthen others through it. That despite our deficiencies, that we pray that God would strengthen others. And that should encourage us to know that, that we can make mistakes, that we can do wrong things, and God can redeem those things and still use them for his glory. Because oftentimes I find that we become so overwhelmed, so burdened with guilt, so re living in regret and bitterness over the choices that we've made, that we, we think that we become, we become paralyzed, that God can't use us anymore. But we should pray that God would strengthen, use that to strengthen others. We ask God to glorify his name in our separation and pray that he would use it despite our conflict. He can use us despite our stupidity and not doing things right. It gives hope to realize that our disobedience or disagreements are not beyond God using and redeeming. And in this instance, he used it. He used Paul and Silas to go forward strengthening churches as well as Barnabas and Mark. And it's my proposal that perhaps John Mark proved himself reliable and trustworthy on this trip. He redeemed his reputation so much that, on, that later on, Paul writes about him favorably in Colossians 4.10 and in 2 Timothy 4.10. I love this passage. He says, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark, that's John Mark. And he says, now, go get John Mark and bring him with you, for he's very useful for me. He'd become useful. Now, and rather than he'd saying, I don't want him here, I can't depend on him, he's like, bring him here because he's shown himself to be dependable. He's redeemed himself through this episode. So that's a great thing for us to realize, is that no matter how much we've blown it, no matter how much we might have a disagreement with someone, that God can work favorably despite it. Now we pray for unity, and when there's not unity, we pray that God would use this somehow for his glory. Now notice what happens next in verse 16, 1. Paul came to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Now Paul, here's Paul wanting to, to mentor this young man. Who's, who proved himself to be trustworthy and to, to be useful for ministry. And Paul sees a diamond in the rough, wants to bring him along with him, but there's a problem. And he took him and he circumcised him. I mean, he wasn't circumcised, so Paul circumcises him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now let me elaborate and bring this into our kind of culture, what we see going on. Paul went from Derby to Lystra, cities in the southern part of Galatia, which is now modern-day Turkey. There was a disciple there, a young man by the name of Timothy, who was the son of a Jewish woman and who was a believer in Jesus and whose father, though, was a Greek. Um, and he had a good reputation, and Paul wanted to bring him along, perhaps just like Barnabas did with him, and then he saw with John Mark, so he took and had him circumcised. Why? Because of the Jews in those places who all knew Timothy and his father was a Greek. It's a small community. Now, what can we learn from this? It's that as we are on mission for Christ, we need to be aware of the culture we're trying to reach. See, Paul knew he was going on this mission, and he was going to be entering into this culture, interacting with these people, and he, need, he knew that if he brought Timothy along, that could cause a problem, so he, because he wasn't circumcised. His father, when it says that his mother was Jewish, meaning she was a child of the covenant, she would have wanted circumcision, but his father was a Greek, considered to be the uncircumcised. 
And that was a problem for Jews. And he knew he was going to be ministering in and around Jews and that he needed to, that this could be a massive problem in his ministry. So he, needed under, he understood this culture and he knew that he had to take the steps necessary to enable them to reach the culture that they were in. Now, for many of us, we don't think about culture much, but culture is really the ball game. Because when you understand culture, you understand how people think, you understand how people interact and move. I've spent my life, my adult life, trying to understand culture. Because culture is where we learn how to think, how to value things, what we do, what we do. And we have cultures all over the place that we belong in. We don't even think about it. It's a little bit like the fish in water that was asked, hey, how's the water? And the fish goes, what water? You don't think about it. You don't think about this until someone violates that norm. When you, when you think about, when you see someone violating that norm, then you get up in angst because they, they violate it. It's like, for example, let's put in a modern day understanding of this. Let's say there's a wedding day and uh, uh, the, the bride comes all in. What's the bride? What color is she wearing? White, cultural, right? Let's say someone else wears, another beautiful woman wears a big, long white dress. Is that going to be offensive to people? For some, yeah, because you don't wear white on the bride's wedding day. That's this cultural thing that's there. What, do you, what color do you normally wear at a funeral? Black, right? Customary. Not every culture does this, but these are some that are there, okay? Or if someone were to take an American flag and stomp on it, would that get some people frustrated? Yes, because it represents something. These are all cultural values that we, we teach and we interact with how we do certain things. Or maybe someone's driving down the street in, in our culture and you roll down a window and they just throw out their trash. Are you going to get frustrated? Yeah, these are cultural things that we've learned. I remember when I was in India, I passed out some uh, sweets to my class and the kid, one of the, the I mean, these are adults. They, they take some candy, takes it, leaves it out the window and just throws it out the window. And I'm like, ah, but that was my cultural value. I was betraying my, my culture who didn't want to litter and, and values that public cleanliness. So there are, there are all these different things that we have to be aware of, how things get done, who you ask, who you don't ask, what's right, what's wrong, when you stand, when you sit, how you behave publicly, how you behave at weddings and funerals, and how you behave at school and interact. There are all these things that are a part of our culture. And Paul knew that if he was to reach this Jewish culture that he himself came from, he's going to have to help Timothy out in order to minister in it effectively. Now, why do I share that, this with you, and why do we need this principle? Today, we are a multicultural nation. I was speaking to a, a church planner friend of mine last uh, Friday night, uh, an old friend. We went to college together. He's now working with the Southern Baptist as kind of this local missionary for Chicagoland, and he says, I've never seen a culture more diverse than it is now. I was hearing about the fastest growing languages in the United States. I saw this morning that the fastest growing language in the uh, southeastern United States or the eastern United States, what do you think it is? Some would say Spanish, right? It's not. Telugu, which is from southern India. Our nation is becoming more and more diverse. You can go up to parts of Minnesota and only be with the Hmong people. You can go down to Louisville and have an entire strip mall, which is filled with Somalis. You can go to Grand Rapids, Michigan, or Dearborn, Michigan, and it's all in Arabic. You can go parts to Washington, and it's all in Russian. I mean, you're, this is our culture. It's becoming more and more diverse with all the different cultures that are there, that we are this giant group of people coming together, and if we're to minister to people, we have to be able to cross cultural barriers. And we need to understand. And now we always expect people to adjust to us. But that's not what you see Paul doing. You don't, go, you don't see Paul going around, by the way, you Gentiles, get circumcised, line up. I want you to hear the word of God. Yeah, they're not doing that. And first of all, they're like, say what? I'm out. <laughs> but you see him going to the nth degree because he understood this culture and he wanted him to hear the message of Jesus because that's the greatest thing that we need to understand. And that's the greatest thing that they need. Now there's all these things that go with that, but just like with Franklin Graham was showing, is that we wanna give them, we wanna meet their, their needs, their, their relational needs, their material needs, but in that we want them to be able to meet their greater spiritual need, which is Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand and be aware of the culture that we are trying to reach because there are all these cultural ways of expressing this. I, I, I wrote this in my notes, I wanted to share this real quick. 
<laughs> because cultures have a different way of communicating things. There are certain things in America you don't talk about, so, uh, you don't say to someone else, right? <laughs> so we had a, uh, a friend of mine, um, we had a Middle Eastern man, and he, he came up and he uh, was talking to a friend, and he goes, hey, uh, should I tell him that his wife is getting fat, or should you? And I'm like, what? No! <laughs> And, and he's like, why? He said, that's just culturally offensive. He goes, oh, he had no, in his culture, it's, it's just normal. Hey, you're getting fat. <laughs> you're getting fat. And in some cultures, that's a compliment. Really? <laughs> it's awesome. I can't wait to go to those cultures. I'm a king. But it's true. These are cultural ways of explaining things. And so Paul is very much aware of this culture and what's offensive to them is that, that Timothy's not circumcised. Now, did he have to be circumcised? No, we just came off the Jerusalem Council where they said that circumcision didn't mean anything, but he wanted to reach that culture, so he was willing to have to go through this so that they could reach that people group. So we have to be aware of the culture that we're trying to reach, and we need to understand the culture that our church is in. A few years ago, we had a study commissioned at Village Bible Church Aurora Campus that surveyed the immediate three-mile radius of our church. And it examined language, marital status, income, education, I mean, everything that you can think of in between. And then it takes and shows us, uh, the, the, uh, the, the guy who was uh, doing the study for us, he uh, showed us, this consultant, showed us the spectrum of ministry. And then it is easy ministry and extremely hard ministry. And he said, if they are a homogeneous society, meaning that the people all have the same education, the same background, the same language, same culture, that's relatively easy ministry. Because everybody already understands one another. You don't have to be a real student of the culture. Everybody gets it. They all grew up in it. They understand those things. But then on the other side is extremely challenging. So I was really waiting to see where we came out on the spectrum. Anybody want to take a guess? Extremely challenging. And that's awesome. And he said, but the cool thing is, I've come to your church. Your church is representative of the community that you live in, which means that you're reaching an extremely challenging group. And that's some of the things that we're doing here, and we want to do it more and more because we want to be able to meet the needs of our community. God has placed us here. And so we want to make sure that we are understanding the culture that we're trying to reach. We have a diversity of people working different schedules and they have different backgrounds and different education levels and different economic levels and marital status. And we need to be aware of that when we're ministering to people, that we have people that, uh, we have a lot of single parents out there and we need to be able to help them so that they don't feel paralyzed and they can't hear the message of Christ. We have some that feel rather hopeless. We have some that are time impoverished, where they're so busy they can't finish th or get things done. I mean, we have a lot of languages in our culture, which is unbelievable. And so we want to make sure that we are trying to reach and understand the culture we're trying to reach. We need to be students of our culture. And if you thought ministry was easy, then I have another... <laughs> then you're going to get a reality check. Ministry is not easy, although many would like it to be. But the fact is, ministry can be complicated and involves many messy situations. As you're trying to reach people in this culture or the culture that you live and you work in, uh, whether you're at your workplace with your people, you need to understand that culture and how to share Jesus in the middle of that. And, and, and it can be done. It's not impossible. It can't be. Ministry involves many messy situations. And here's, here's the messy situation. It's Timothy. Paul's looking at Timothy going, okay, his mom's a believer. His grandmother was a believer. Both of them were known for their piety. I don't understand then why she married this Greek guy. Now, maybe they were married. Maybe they were not. Maybe that they, uh, maybe she had a, a time of temptation. Maybe this was before she came to know Jesus. Maybe it was a one night stand. Maybe they were married together. Maybe it was an unequally real relationship. We don't know. We do know that it was messy because Paul comes along and goes, how do I do this with this guy? I see Christ in him. I know he's a believer. I know his mom's a believer, but I know his dad's not a believer. The Greek word, the word when it says that he's a Greek, it's not just referring to cultural, but, but also religious, meaning that he's not a believer in Jesus, and he's not Jewish. So this, you have this unequally yoked relationship in some way, and there's this child, Timothy, who's by nature rather timid, but yet, he loves the Lord, he wants to serve, he wants to grow. Paul wants to use him, but he's like, he knows he's not circumcised. And so he's like, this is messy, I don't know what to do with this. You kinda, I wish your family was just perfect, but no, it's messy. And we're gonna encounter people in messy situations. 
There are people right now, if you look in your family and your life, you know there's a mess. So-and-so is married to so-and-so, this kid with that. I don't know whose brother or sister is that. They're half-brothers over there, over there. Uh, that couple's living together. This couple's this. This couple's that. I don't, it's messy. Ministering to people is messy. And so we have to make sure and understand that. I mean, this is not anything new. It was messy then. It involves several different messy situations. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we minister to this? How do we go through this? I mean, we, not, we may not be faced with the issue of circumcision, but we will have messy situations that we will have to deal with. Like this, do I go to the marriage when they shouldn't be getting married? Do I attend this religious service even though I disagree with it? Do I participate in that funeral? Do I eat that food? Do I stay at that home if they're living together? I mean, there are numerous situations that are messy that cause us to scratch our head, to cry out to God, pray diligently, study the scriptures, and ask God for guidance and wisdom from godly leaders about. Faith is, a, is most often forged through the various messy circumstances of life. Now, as we're able, we do well to remove possible stumbling blocks. Now, what Paul what did he do with Timothy? He circumcised him. I mean, he personally circumcised him. It's not a pleasant picture, but uh, it was something very cultural, and it wasn't for salvation purposes, but so as to remove any possible stumbling blocks or criticisms that would keep the Jews from hearing the message of Christ. Now, there is a difference between the stumbling blocks on the way to the gospel and the stumbling block of the gospel. The gospel is a stumbling block that cannot be moved, but the stumbling blocks on the way to the gospel, if we can remove them, we do it. Paul shed some light on this process in his strategy for ministry in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 21. He says this, For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant of all, that I might meant more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew. I lived under the law in order to win them. I wanted them to know who Jesus was. I was willing to observe the dietary laws. I was willing to observe these days. I didn't need to for my salvation, but I did it because I wanted them to hear the message of Jesus. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, which is the law of love that I might win those outside the law. So he was willing to become all things to all men by all means that he might save some. And if you want to reach a Hindu, then become a vegan for them. If you want to reach Jews or Muslims, abstain from pork while with them. Yes, you can eat meat and pork freely, but abstain for a time while with them shows that you care a great deal about them and that you want to be able to share the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, my wife has a, 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 we have a relative who is a hardcore vegan. I mean, hardcore vegan. He has this tat on his forearm that says, meat is murder. And then on his arm, it's wild, wild tattoo. It's, uh, he's got one of uh, Ronald McDonald, the uh, colonel from Kentucky Fried Chickens, and Wendy, and it has a bullet going through their brains. And he's a militant vegan. He's, he's a great guy, really. He's fun to talk to. He's fun to hang out with. He's just a militant vegan, really into thrash metal. And uh, he, we want to reach him with the gospel. So we, we, we've hung out a few times and we're like, okay, I, I, I need to understand this vegan thing. Take me to the best vegan restaurant you want to. I want to sit down with you. I want to talk with you. I want to learn with you. I want to be able to share Jesus with you. And so we sat down and I got, I mean, it's really tricky when you go and you look at the menu and everything's in quotes. Like instead of it being a Philly cheesesteak, it's a Philly cheese steak. <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? <laughs> if it's, and I tasted it and it tastes like meat. And I'm like, this is really weird. It's not meat. Okay, but he was, he, I think he was impressed by the fact that we would care enough to hang out with him. And he, he came to Chicago once he was in this really huge thrash metal band and they came in with all the spacers in their ears and all their tats. And I mean, and he, he says, hey, we're gonna be in town. Can you go to the concert? I said, I can't go to the concert. I've got a ministry thing that night, but we'd love to have you over for dinner. The whole band. And so we had this whole band. So it's me <laughs> as this pastor and all these guys and piercings all over. And I'm like, hey, come on in. <laughs> and he said, we were the only family that would let them in the house. I want them to know Jesus, to share Jesus. And I've got opportunities to share Jesus. And he hasn't come to Christ yet, but I'm still praying that he does. But I'm willing to interact with them, to, to take that extra mile, to communicate with them, uh, because I want to remove those stumbling blocks so he hears Jesus. I don't want to complain about his music. I'm not a huge fan. I don't understand what they're saying. 
I asked him, I was like, so your music goes, and he said, well, to the uneducated ear, yes. And I'm like, all right, I'll be uneducated, whatever. Because I want you to know Jesus. I'm willing to listen to it. I'm willing to go to your concert. I'm willing to have you guys over for food. I don't care. I want you to know Jesus. He'll take care of the rest. But I want to try to remove stumbling blocks. I want to talk to them. I want to engage with them. I want to remove these possible stumbling blocks. That's what Paul was doing. That's why he circumcised Timothy. And he did it because he wanted to be able to share effectively. We want to be able to share effectively the message of whose Christ is. It's the message of Jesus Christ that we want them to hear. That Jesus is king, that he's paid for our sins, taken our shame, borne the sentence and penalty of death on the cross because of his love for us. He rose again and then ascended into heaven where he awaits to enter into the fullness of his kingdom. And this gospel is a royal proclamation that Jesus is king and that he rules and reigns and will enter into the fullness of his kingdom at the end of time. And until that time, we plead with people to be reconciled to God. We help them. We seek justice. We want to be able to help those who can't help themselves. We want to stand up for the unfortunate. I mean, for those who are, are the most vulnerable among us so that they know who Jesus is. That they might enter that kingdom by abandoning their sins and placing their faith in him. That's what Paul wanted to be able to minister and share Christ effectively. And that is exactly what happened in verse 4. It says, as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions. He's talking to the church that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. It's the verdict that came from the Jerusalem council about the Old Testament, about how they would behave in this society. And so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers also. The Jews had to give him a hard time because they knew he'd undergone circumcision. And they're ready to hear. The ministry operated smooth, smoothly, presumably because of Paul's actions. They were able to share what God had done among the Gentiles, as well as deliver the proclamation from the Jerusalem Council about what is necessary for salvation and how the Old Testament was to be observed. However, there's an odd transition in verse 6. As they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, there are a lot of details to go through here, so let's walk through them to get our bearings. From Antioch and Pisidia, which is modern-day Turkey, Paul and Timothy traveled northward and then westward and then northward again. And they proceeded uh, via the, uh, the Via Sebaste, which is a Roman military road into this region of Phrygia, which is in central Turkey. He continued in that direction and have been headed straight to Asia through Ephesus uh, to a coastal city a bit like San Diego. So imagine if we were to put it in like the United States terminology, it's like he's passing through southern Nevada and he's heading to California and he, takes a, and he goes up this way. Rather than going to San Diego, he just starts to go north. And it says that as he's, he's uh, it says he, instead he was forbidden to speak in Asia by the Holy Spirit, this region by the Holy Spirit of God. That's a bit strange. Why would he be forbidden to speak? If we're to make disciples, then why be silent? And whatever the case, reason why, Paul listens and then proceeds to head up north again to another region northwest of Phrygia called Mysia, and from there into Bithynia, which was adjacent to it. And once again, the Spirit of Jesus, another name for the Holy Spirit, prevented them. It's a strange journey for them. At the beginning, it seemed like a normal transition for them to preach the gospel in all of the cities that they passed through, but instead, the Holy Spirit directed them on a 400-mile journey by foot to Troas. And when there, Paul has a vision of a man from Macedonia, which is uh, just south of Greece, standing there urging him to come to Macedonia, or excuse me, north of Greece, and help them. And Paul concluded that God was speaking through that vision and he was to go to Macedonia. Now, what principles that we, can we draw from this? There are a few things. The first thing is that we have to know and trust that, trust that God knows what he's doing in the Great Commission. God knows what he's doing he, in the Great Commission. He has some that he has designated for destruction and then there are others for salvation. This might sound harsh to our modern ears, but we have to remember that he is God and we are not. God didn't have to save anybody. 
he was perfectly just to condemn us all. We were all sentenced to death, and the fact that he wants to save any at all is a miracle in and of itself. So he knows what he's doing in the Great Commission. And all this is also to say that God is sovereign. He knows what he's doing. Paul spoke about this in Romans chapter 9, verse 14 through 24. Because people would ask, if God chooses some and not others, that doesn't make sense. How are we called to make disciples? That doesn't seem fair, God. And Paul responds to that type of questioning. And he says, are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. I can't be compelled. They don't deserve me to show mercy. I show it if, I, if this person, and they were all convicted killers, I don't have to choose and save any of them. I can save anyone I want for the reason that I want. I will show mercy to anyone I choose and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. So it is God who decides to show mercy whether we can neither choose it nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. Meaning even Pharaoh and the hardening of his heart and all of the different things that came, God orchestrated to show his power. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so that they refuse to listen. That's a scary thing. Well, then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Have they simply done what he makes them to do? No, don't, argue, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have a right to choose the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and, and another to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those whom his anger falls who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who are prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Here's the point. God is sovereign. And he has a specific strategy for making himself known. He hardens some and he softens others. We don't know why. We know we operate on what we do know. We interpret the unclear in the light of the clear, that he has a plan for bringing people to the saving knowledge of his name. He has a plan for how and when the gospel is made known in specific cultures and in specific times. I don't pretend to understand it, but I can see by this passage he didn't want his name known yet to a specific group of people. It could be that he wanted someone else to deliver the message rather than Paul and Silas. Or it could be that he felt he was waiting for the judgment to come to its full fruition in that people group for a time. Now, he did this with the Amorites in Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 through 16. And we read this. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, who would become Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. He's telling Abraham what's going to happen in the future. And he says, Your people, this promised land you're not going to get yet, their people are going to be there, but then they're going to go into Egypt, basically. He doesn't say the name, but they're going to be imprisoned in Egypt for 400 years. But, after, but I will bring judgment on the nation they serve. I'm going to bring judgment on the Egyptians. He's, this is a prophecy. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your father's house in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. And here's the reason why. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Amorites were the ones living in the land, meaning that God had a limit to their sin and it's growing, 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 and then he's going to act. And he was going to send Israel to be his rod of judgment, that they were going to be the means of which judgment was being wrought upon this people. And he says, there's a time, I'm going to let it go, and then I'm going to judge them. I can't, I'm not going to take it anymore. It's going to stop. There's a limit. It's just like when he was a parent. You, you have your kid, they say something to you, you go, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. No, don't. And there's a limit that you have where you go, now it's time to act. And it's the same with God, with us. No, no, no. And he says, I got a limit, then I'm going to bring judgment upon them. And there are some that have accused God of genocide. Did they commit genocide by destroying this people? We're in the mind of God. They're the, the means by which judgment would come. The Israelites were to act and fulfill God's judgment upon them by being the rod or the, the means by which this was, judgment was going to be accomplished. 
And so here we wonder, I'm not saying that is exactly that, but there's a reason why God says, no, I don't want the gospel to go to them. They are, I'm giving them over. Now that seems so antithetical to us in our modern day culture because we hear, go and make disciples of all nations. Yes, we're to make disciples of all nations. That's what God's called us to do. So we, we interpret the unclear in light of the clear. We don't know who God's going to take out and who he's not. We know that we're to call and make disciples. And that's what we do, knowing that God is sovereign, he has a strategy, he has a purpose, don't play to understand it, but we have to listen to the spirit when he speaks. We must listen to his spirit when he speaks to us. See, we interpret the unclear in light of the clear. The clear truth is that we're to share the gospel and make disciples of all nations. We know that. However, there are times when God shows up and speaks by his spirit to us in certain situations about certain people who are not to share with. It's a general principle. God is sovereign. That's the general principle. And we're to share unless he says otherwise. We need to listen to his spirit and make sure that it is his spirit who is talking and not our fears. We don't know how the spirit spoke when he told them no, but we know that he said no. And then he gave a vision to where they go and they obeyed it. Now, we also should draw from this that God is compassion and he's long-suffering, but there is a limit. That which means it and should press upon us a greater urgency to make his name known and a gratitude that he's enabled us to be recipients of salvation. To think that he's allowed us to be a part of that. The privilege that you have. Do you realize the privilege that you have of being known by God and being called a child of God, to be called out? I got news this past week that... uh, it was a girlfriend of mine from high school. She was a close friend. Uh, she had taken her own life. I've had more death this past 13 months than I ever try to want to deal with again. Whether it's suicide, whether it's family members dying, I've said goodbye to six family and friends. Three family, three friends, two by their own hand. And I am, I'm always astounded at how people grieve online. And I know that she had rejected Christ for her whole life. And to know of what eternity she's stepping into. I I think we underestimate hell and overestimate everyone going into heaven. And not everyone is. Not everyone is. The scripture is very clear. Broad is the pathway to destruction, and if you find it, and narrow is the road to eternal life. And if it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't have that opportunity to have life. And so we have to understand that eternity hangs in the balance, that we stand between the living and the dead. And we have to listen to his spirit and know that God is sovereign, but also know that that God himself didn't have to save us. He didn't have to do anything for us. He chose because of the greatness of his mercy and his love to save you that you would understand, that you know that Jesus even says it very clearly, that no one can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. That faith itself is a gift. That grace is not only the gift, but the ability to respond and do what God wants you to do. And that without that, you can't do it on your own. That's why not everybody goes to heaven. That's why not everybody worships the same God. That's why there's only one God, and he's revealed himself within his word, and there's only one way of salvation, and that's through Christ and him alone. I saw a study, I can't remember who it was done by, but they were saying evangelicals like you and me, they said that I think it was over half think that all people worship the same being, or God accepts all worship. No! I'd say that those people aren't reading the word of God. Don't be, the word, don't be ignorant of what the word says. What does the word say? We have to be able to wrestle with what the word of God says to us. And that's why we have to be students of the word of God and listen when he speaks to us by his spirit and that we know and we have to interpret the unclear in light of the clear. We don't understand why he did this. Perhaps it was his judgment that he was, he was enabling to happen. Perhaps he had someone else he wanted to share with it. We know that we're to make disciples until he tells us otherwise. Now this past week, I came across this article. I want to conclude with this. I mean, I was hesitant to even put this point in my notes. Because I find many Christians look for any excuse not to share. The principle is to share unless God says otherwise. We are to share. We're to preach. And we're to realize that there's going to be conflict and that we need to be students of the cultures we're trying to reach. But 
I came across something this past week that really bothered me. This past March, the country of Turkey declared that Christian evangelism is an act of terror. It's a terrorist act. Evangelism. It's an act of terror. It's like placing a bomb in a public square. It's terrorism. Now, my question for us is this. If that is the criteria, would there be enough evidence to be tried and convicted according to their criteria? Would you be a terrorist or would you not? In that case, I'd want to be a terrorist. Are we? Could we be indicted of that in Turkey if we were to go? Say, sure, well, if you're not doing it here, what makes you think you're going to do it there? Would we be indicted? Would we be convicted? We have learned what happens as we serve Christ, continue on mission for him. And knowing that, what we're going to face, what God has done, and what he's calling us to do is half the battle. Let's close this message time with a word of prayer. Lord, who is sufficient for these things? It's through the foolishness of preaching you save those who believe. There are so many mysteries within your word that are so unfathomable, that are so difficult to digest. And we in our frail humanity and our limited understanding often feel inept, confused, afraid, and unsure of who we are and what you've called us to do. And despite our humanity, you call to us and your word cuts through our confusion like light cuts through darkness. And Lord, cut through our confusion and misunderstanding and bring clarity that we might live by, that we might be anchored to and have as a firm foundation that we might build upon. Lord, show us how we are to deal with conflict once we face it, how we can study and understand the culture that we live in and minister in, whether it's a culture in our own workplaces or the culture that our family possesses and its way of doing things or with our classmates and our circle of friends. Lord, we ask you to invade by your spirit and enable us to be the vessels by which you work through. Lord, forgive us when we do fail. Forgive us when we falter. Forgive us when we come up with excuses and we shy away from proclaiming your name. But propel us forward that no matter what conflicts we might face, no matter what the culture is we might be ministering in, Lord, please show us your glory and help us to fulfill your great commission by making disciples of all nations. So Lord, bless us, be with us, and use us to make your name known to every single people group, every person, on this planet, so that they might know and love you. Bless us and be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Before I dismiss you, just want to remind you that we have our membership class that takes place in about 20 minutes. It'll be through the door to uh, your right. Just make your way back there to the classroom. Uh, There'll be someone that's waiting for you in there. John Rosas, I believe, is teaching that class, and he would love to greet you. Uh, And also want to encourage you to continue on your walk with the Lord. Uh, You might say, how do I jumpstart my walk? Part of it is is getting into a small group or reading the Word of God. So you can, uh, if you're looking for that opportunity, please let us know. We'd love to connect you. Uh, And also, if you're looking to sponsor one of the students for uh, our fall camp, please let us know. um, And we will be glad to help you out with that. With that in mind, please stand as we conclude our service with the benediction. Receive the benediction. O Lord our God, who has called us unto yourself, Protect us and propel us that we might share the mystery of Christ through whom you created the world and you have enabled redemption to occur. Bless us, be with us, give us peace in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.